Welcome back to Coagula Overdose. So we have begun our journey, and I think there's a new system that the game wants to teach us about. Let me track down this girl right here, Midori. Talk to me. Hey, mind if I ask you something? Um, there's something I failed to ask it guidance. Is that so? I had no idea. Thanks, that's a big help. So this game is this like weird system where you get to meet NPCs. When you become acquainted, they'll be registered in wire, and you'll be able to exchange messages with them. You can become closer with students you meet by chatting with them, and their profiles will eventually be unlocked. Through this method, you'll be able to gradually, well that was weird, uncover each student's true hidden nature. So let's look in the menu. Let me first go into system. I need to freaking change my uh, message speed, speed that shit up. There we go. So there's this little area called causality link. This is a web of literally every student in the game. Everyone, including uh, our party members, like right here's Mifue's thing. She's a lively, energetic, friendly girl. One of the livelier Go Home Club members has a sisterly vibe about her. Former volleyball player who's known for her attractive long legs. Her healthy figure makes her giant appetite for food a bit surprising. So you get all these students, including people we don't know, and there is a goal in the game to, it's completely optional, but to meet everyone and like fill out their stuff and get to know them. And they kind of act as like the side quests. Now this is incredibly daunting, and in my like two and a half times of playing this game previously, I've never so much as attempted it. It's, it's really crazy. For one, you can actually like give them powers and like bring them into combat. I don't know why you ever would versus your regular party members unless you're in a, like in a weird pinch situation in which you don't have access to a full party, which is kind of like right now, but ignoring that. Uh, but usually it's for like completing their like little sub stories. They all have names. They have a little bit of like character information. They have some reason that they're here in Mobius the same way that our party members main cast are. And you get, you can get to know that. Now the way I think it works, let me talk to, or try to talk to Yuichi here. What the hell are you doing? It's annoying to be accosted out of the blue like that. Students' relationships to one another are illustrated in the causality link diagram accessible from the main menu. To become closer to any shy students, or to become closer to shy students, get closer to students adjacent to them. And they should open up to you. So you see that he has a, where do you go? There he is. He has a lock symbol next to his name. So I don't know what class he's in, he's somewhere in that web. But it means that uh, eventually to like get to know him, I'd have to get to know the students that are around him. So I think it's like a domino effect. You talk to people like Shoko here, who have something going on in their lives. You get acquainted with them and become friends eventually. I think you can even mash it out like I can talk to her again. And we'll immediately go up to uh, level 2. The conversations we have until like level 3 are fake. They're they are like repeated among several students. So now I think we become friends. I've been hearing people say that I'm bad luck. They say that strange and freaky things happen whenever I show up. Can you believe that nonsense? I have no idea what they're talking about. If weird stuff always happens around me, then shouldn't I notice? So these rumors are starting to hurt my reputation. I wonder if things will work out somehow. So you can talk to her again, but I don't think I'll be able to level up. Yeah, we say at level 3, and I want to say for the NPCs, the max uh, affinity for them is 5. Whereas your regular party members is like 9, I think. So give me a second here. I want to find where she is in the causality link, so this might take a minute, because there's so many goddamn students. Oh no, it stays right on her. It goes immediately to her. Cool. So, uh... We got, like, her tr basic trauma. Spreads nasty rumors leading to a, to a group's eternal collapse. Has a habit of destroying things. To alleviate, restore relationship with the people involved in the group's division. Meet people from people of the same sex with frenemy dilemma. So all these people have, like, weird traumas, and you have to meet people like her that I think will eventually help her out. I'm not entirely sure how it works, but for once, in this playthrough, I actually want to make a bit of an effort to try and do this. A lot of this will be done off camera because it's kind of like additional busy work that pads out the game. 
but I will update you on it as I do it. I'll uh, mainly be doing it away from the videos and not even on stream. But, uh, you know, we'll see. We'll see what happens with it. If uh, I start getting really cool things down the line, and if I really start putting work into it, maybe I'll work uh, some of it into future videos. All right, so we got to go around the school and start uh, hitting up places with exclamation points on the map to look for information about our first ostinato musician, Kagi P. And people aren't going to be able to tell us, tell us anything, as you can probably imagine. They don't really know anything. But eventually I should start getting like the combat information. Here we go. Here's like our second battle of the game. Look at that. The ones from the train station. They've gone digi-head. It's a little pathetic, but as of right now, you're the only one to have the power to fend them off. If we can avoid being seen. We can avoid fighting altogether. I leave it to you. Battle begins when you're discovered by an enemy. Win by reducing all enemies' HP to zero. However, if you take damage from enemies and your party's HP is reduced to zero, it's game over. Make sure you save frequently. When you want to run from battle, select the escape skill from the action tab. Or the more enemies there are, the harder it becomes to flee. Face an enemy and press the X button to attack them. If you succeed at doing this without being noticed by an enemy, you can start a battle with the enemy's wrist filled up and you'll have the advantage. So back up, do a little kick in their backs. So the risk number is the number to the left of their uh, like health bars. They're kind of overlapping, but you see that they each have a risk level of four. The highest it can go is five, and beyond that, you will risk break them, and it'll make them incredibly vulnerable. I think when they're risk broken for like a set period of time, they will take like double damage, maybe something like that. So I should focus on one of them. There you go. I risk broke him right at the very end. So one on one fight now. Combat, as I've learned, in, uh, because I had to replay this first hour, it's not very difficult. And I played the game in Japanese. I put it on easy because the language barrier. And this uh, playthrough will be on normal. And even like the first couple hours of playing the game on normal not that hard it's not a difficult game i think there's certain like challenges you can do certainly if you get into the like uh the optional dungeons the secret one secret ones maybe those will be pretty tough but getting through the main story not difficult at all So you may notice that the game's sound design uh, is that every dungeon will have its own song. So this is Kagi P's song called Peter Pan Syndrome. And uh, it'll play uh, throughout the entire dungeon, which is for better or worse what it is. Uh, some people don't like this game's sound design, and I don't blame them because it's incredibly repetitive. Now I do like this game's soundtrack a whole heck of a lot. I really do. I own the original soundtrack for the Vita game. Uh, they they give you some uh, so new songs for Overdose as well. I uh, had like the mini soundtrack they included with the Japanese version. I even have the soundtrack to the uh, anime remixes. The problem is that the songs just get repeated ad nauseum. And what happens is that in the regular dungeon, when you're exploring, you get the instrumental version of the musician songs. And then you get the lyrical version when you get into combat. So let's see, we're going to find anyone in this classroom? Of course not. Oh no, wait, this guy's gonna freak out and he's gonna become a digi head! Within enemies' attack skills lies those with shooting or rushing properties. If you hit enemies with an attack that has an advantage over their properties, you can cancel their attack. This is called a counter. Select attack skills that have shooting properties such as hate cannon and vintage strike to successfully perform a counter attack. Got a vintage strike, this guy. And then chain a couple of dual triggers with it. I didn't kill him, though. He's still going. So look at him slowly get up. You can see that there is a cooldown meter at the top right. So you know exactly how long it's going to be, like when your next attack comes out. Wow, fantastic. Three misses. Thanks, game. And you can see how long until you next get to select actions. 
Did they want me to like do it twice in a row? Also, when you run out of SP like this, you can recharge with Soul Surge. I don't know why I had three misses on that last round. That was bullshit. <laughs> When you're hit by an attack, you might be in one of two states, aerial or downed. You'll, you'll be in mobile for a period of time while in these states. There are characters with skills that can dole out high amounts of damage depending on the conditions. Select a skill that fits the conditions and turn the battle to your advantage. I can't believe they attacked us out of the blue like that. That's never happened before. I wonder what's wrong. The Digiheads are more violent than usual because of the musician's song. If we don't find him soon, we might end up in serious danger. A student's erosion rate is displayed as a percentage to the left of their name. Those eroded 50% or higher become Digiheads. When a student you want to befriend is in a Digihead state, you can lower their erosion rate by defeating them. It's a good idea to consistently battle students who have become Digiheads. So sometimes, uh, let me find like another one of these Digiheads, which is a terrible name by the way. I, it's what they're called in Japanese and English, I just don't like it because it sounds dumb. It sounds like they're ravenous Digimon fans or something. Hmm, that's... That's a treasure chest. Effectively, that's what it is. What's that weird clump? That's a stigma. Rakuin in Japanese. So freaking weird. Like, why would... If canonically she's speaking Japanese, why would she say that? They're like ribbed into the souls of people trapped in Mobius. That's disturbing. You said remnants. That used to be a human trapped in Mobius like us? Yes. Humans whose souls disappear from Mobius for one reason or another. Their lingering will crystallize is like this. Will crystallize. Singular. That's a typo. So it's like their regrets? And it could happen to me too. A scary prospect. That being said, it is made of strong enough will to survive alone in Mobius like this. You should be able to use it. We'll probably find similar ones all over Mobius. If you find one, take it with you. It might give you something useful. I'll use them gratefully then. That's a super Japanese term. There are three types of stigmas. Attack impulse, defense instinct, and amplify. You can equip them from the equipment screen. Attack impulse increases attack and accuracy. Defense instinct raises defense and HP. Amplify boosts SP and critical. In addition to levels and statuses, you can view personalities from the main menu status screen. Personalities show each character's nature and will display wh which parameters are best suited for them. Their personalities are decided from the beginning for each character, but only the protagonist can help them in their growth by resolving their worries. Oh yeah, at Defense Instinct True Rigor. Anything in this room? There is. Damn it, I didn't want to talk to you. You don't even know anything! Something else in here? They're digi heads. So let's look at the equipment. This game has a super bizarre equipment system. So you don't have armor, you don't wear accessories even. You have stigmas, attack impulse, defense instinct, and amplify. And the apparel is just like your actual uh, appearance. Like I have pre ordered DLC I can wear right here. So they have weird naming conventions. They're named after like actual stigmas and conditions and whatnot. Musical Live, True Rigor, Two-Faced. They get really creative with the names. There's a lot of them. And it's hard to know what they do based on just the names. It's impossible even. You just have to look in the menu and see what they do. Like this one does attack plus 40. Uh, I I can uh, change to like defense plus 24 and HP plus 320, which is pretty damn good. <laughs> I don't know where I got that. Yeah, sometimes uh, enemies drop stigmas and like I think what you get is completely random. So you might end up fighting something really good, just by chance. Alright, so these digi heads are lost souls. They're nobody. They are just enemies. They are foot soldiers. But every now and then you'll come across a digi head that actually is one of the game's NPCs, one of its students. And to like actually be able to meet them, you're, you're going to have to fight them as a digi head. And then I think they'll disappear for a while, but they'll come back and be normal. So you might have to do that if you want to complete the causality link. You might have to do it a lot. Oh, 
Let me focus on the level one guy. I'm close to being able to take out level one enemies. No, I did do it in two hits. The imaginary chain underestimated me. Underestimated my damage output. Take that. Level two is a little thick for me though. And granted, I'm not putting too much thought into this combat strategy, but that's because I don't need to. Like, look how little damage they're doing. Part of that's because that stigma I found. That, that thing's really strong. Thank you. There's a piece of paper on the ground. It's a list of initials connected by thin lines. This must be a correlation chart of everyone in the class. It's organized by rank. There are only initials on it, so the identities aren't obvious. Who would make something like this? On the edges, L, the lowest rank, with no power. Touch upon the mysteries of this world. Acquired three points of skill points. Use skill points to learn skills. By selecting a skill point from the main menu, you can view the skills you can learn or ones you've already learned. In order to learn it, you'll need to be at the minimum required level and have sufficient skill points. Skill points are acquired when you level up or defeat an enemy. You can also acquire them by coming into contact with suspicious traces. So that would be this menu down here, the records of Mobius, suspicious traces. I believe in the English Vita version, these were called World Wonders. You see that there is a list of them in the game, but you can't like, I can't highlight them. It's just swapping between these pages. And finding them uh, nets you skill points. Now I don't know if it does anything beyond that. There is a weird one that we'll find a little later in like a video or two that's very strange and mysterious. And I don't know what's up with it. Hmm, this is bad. Digiets have blocked the way. It's a single girl. It's a futile effort to avoid confrontation in such a small building. Sorry, but I need to depend on you. I won't tell you to avoid fights, but just be careful. Use your judgment. I wish I could help more. Don't overdo it. Well, you will help, eventually. She didn't even notice me. So, I know one of this game's like early patches in Japan was that they toned down like enemy AI. Because they were really aggressive in coming after you. And I think uh, enemies can also respawn. So, if you stay in an area long enough, some of these suits will come back. And I think they toned that down as well. But say what you will about the soundtrack, but that seamless transition between the two versions is nice. What's in here? Someone who also knows nothing. Every student we talk to like that, they all look the goddamn same. More lost souls. Walk over there, losers. Look at that one girl trapped on the outside of the bubble. Yeah, so like the battle arena is like super in real time. The reason this exists is because the Vita version didn't have this. There was no like cool digital arena you fought in. So you would just fight on the spot of where you were standing. And that was an awful idea. Because that made the fighting look really jank. And sometimes you get stupid ass situations where your party would be fighting a digi head and half the party would be in a classroom and the other half was out in the hallway. It was fucking stupid. It looked so terrible and bad. And it really turned me off from this game when I finally got to see it after like hearing about it for months before it came out. But then they came up with this as a solution for overdose. It's not perfect, but admittedly, it's pretty cool. I like it. Let me get some SP back here. Ow, stop shooting me. Coward. Take this. Are you serious? Come on, MC. Making me look bad here. Trying to get through this fight so we can get on to the next bit. Come on. There we go. You know, for like a 95% hit rate, I'm kind of getting screwed here. Let's see, are we going to get another explanation out here in the hallway? It's looking like it.
Wait, those pixelated looking ones. Those are digi heads with an extremely high dependence on Mobius. They've long since sacrificed their sanity for strength. Be careful. No choice but to fight. I'm counting on you, newbie. Skills that protect you from attacks are called guard skills. When an enemy uses a guard skill, your attacks will be ineffective, so be sure to use a skill that can break through their guards. Select the attack Shadow Pierce that can break enemy guards, then use it against the enemy's Doom Barrier ability in order to successfully break their guard. Alright, Shadow Pierce. That'll break the guard, but it's not going to be enough to kill it. So let me use my overdose attack. You see that I have this now from the glowing yellow bar by the MC's name. I don't think it'll show the entire animation here, but it'll show how much damage it's going to do. Or no, this fucker over on the right's going to cancel me out. So let me chain this with a move then. I'll dash over to the right. Yeah, they don't miss me. And then I can do it. So let's try this out. See if it works. Miss me, sucker. Here we go. Not enough to kill, though. As you can imagine, overdose attacks are new to this version. And he put his guard back up. What a bastard. Ah, the freaking, uh, the, uh, imaginary chain says, said that wasn't going to hit me, but it's super lied. All right, get out of here. Their guards do go down naturally, so if you can time it right, you can get attacks in without having to break their guards. Get out of here. Thankfully, combat's gonna go by a lot faster once our, uh, our other party members w awaken to their abilities. Which will happen shortly. It seems that Digihead was interfering with that Sigma there. Interfering? How so? Sometimes Sigmas falter and recede when there are powerful Digiheads around. But since we defeated the Digihead, we should be able to obtain that Sigma just fine. If it's powerful enough to attract Digiheads all on its own, you should be able to put it to good use. I see. Shouldn't people be reacting more to all the loud fighting we're doing? Denizens and Mobius can't perceive what contradicts the simulation. Catharsis effects, Digiheads who succumb. To a normal person, it just looks like a small scuffle. No wonder the crowds who come to watch look so disengaged. Thank Mobius for that, I guess. Oh, I erased Bystander's memories anyway. Don't worry about all that. Just keep fighting Digiheads. What a lazy explanation. That doesn't seem right. Yeah, it's just a locked treasure chest. Beat the enemies and unlock it. Alright, save point there. Let's go over here. What do we got? No useful information in any of the East classrooms. Hopefully we can learn something on the West side. Thank you, that's what I was doing. Take this. Which one of you is stronger? You're level 4. So I'm going to focus on this one. Ah, she survived by, like, barely any hit points. How annoying. Come on, Ritsu. We need to get a turn in here. Fortunately, this is taking so long to where I have no chance of risk-breaking this enemy. And we missed our last round, or else that would have been the fight. Bummer. I guess now this is a good chance to... Ugh, come on, I got a freaking soul surge. Now's a good chance to talk about, like, the fact that this game is super not that great, which is obvious by now if you've, you know, satisfied your morbid curiosity and you weren't familiar with Caligula. This game's not great. It was never great. The Vita version wasn't that good. And the weird thing is that I like it. 
Caligula is a huge guilty pleasure for me, which is why I'm doing this. It's why I've ever cared or ever talked about it. I've talked about Caligula a lot over the last three years. Almost three years. In fact, I remember I, I've been around since day one with this game. Literally day one. Because I remember when it was announced. I want to say it was January of 2016. When I heard about it, I didn't think it was anything special when I saw it. You know, I want to say I was up in like the middle of the night. Therefore, it was time for Japanese gaming news to come on to Twitter from like Gematsu or Silicon Era. Someone posted about it. Didn't really care, but there was a big catch to this game. And the catch was that it was being written by Satomi Tadashi, who was the original uh, scenario character writer for Persona 1 in the Persona 2 duology. And P2 in particular has excellent writing characters. So immediately it was like, oh, that's interesting. I'll have to keep an eye on that. So the game then came out later that year, like less than like six months after it was announced. And I imported it. And I knew it wasn't good then, waited a year for it to get localized, still wasn't good. And yet for some reason I continue to support it, even though I know it's not that good. I gotta fucking soul search again. So just don't make that mistake. As much as I've always talked about Caligula and I've been willing to make content about Caligula, I have never once been like, totally great games, everyone should play it. No, I just liked it. Ever said it was good. And in the, in the Quick Look video of Overdose's Japanese version that I did earlier this year, I talked a little bit about like, I think what's wrong with this game. Now I'm in no way like an expert. I'm not a game designer, nor could I ever be. I, I'm not great at programming. I could barely program web pages and apps. I wouldn't want to learn how to work a game engine. But I talked about like my philosophy on like why this game's presentation's kind of jank. Now there are a lot of like weird things about Caligula that hold it back from being anything super substantial. You could argue like, oh, the dungeon gameplay is not that great. You could say that you don't like uh, the characters or whatever. But I think there are like simple little things in how the game's presented that really lend it to not looking so great. For one, this game is not that pretty in terms of like actual character models and graphics. Part of that seems to be like Vita holdover. But at the same time, they could have cleaned it up. Like, JRPGs don't have to get super creative in terms of like creating character models and how detailed they are, polygon counts and whatnot to look good. Like, obviously, if you're here on this channel, you know me, you know I'm a huge Falcom fan. And modern Falcom with like this generation of games they've been making, like uh, the most recent Sendo Kaseki's um, East 8, Tokyo Xanadu, they don't blow you out of the water in terms of like their graphics, but they look well enough. They look perfectly fine for PS4 games, and they look better than this does. Like the characters and their faces and their animations, they look way better than Caligula. So I think part of the problem with this game is it doesn't know its own limitations and it doesn't do enough to hide it. So in the Quick Look video, I explained how even something like Persona 5, which looks fine by modern standards, but at the same time, P5's not like crazy great. It has essentially the same fidelity that like Catherine had on PS3. And Catherine came out in 2011, Persona 5, five years later. God, these enemies are gonna fuck me up. What if I try to vintage strike you? No, that's not what you're designed for. Disruption trigger, that's what I want, right? No, it's gonna get it in before I can. That's so lame. What if I do this? Yeah, take that. But anyway, like, uh, as much as I like Persona 5, it's not like Persona 5 is a bastion of, like, uh, modern graphics for JRPGs or anything. But, Persona's always employed like this really uh, clever trick that people don't notice. And uh, P3, 4, and even 5, they all do it. And that's that, if you think about like what a cutscene in Persona 5 looks like. And take for example, like any time that the Phantom Thieves are meeting at, uh, what's the coffee place called? Uh, Le Blanc. 
even there, every camera angle in the game, in the regular game engine, will always be a wide shot. It will always be a full shot that you can pretty much every see every character, every character model from head to toe. You can see exactly where they're standing. You can literally see their feet because they're never close ups. They're never even medium shots. You never, almost never see someone from just the waist up. And what this does is it actually like hides the game's like lack of visual detail. And uh, Persona has always relied on letting cutscenes be carried by character portraits, by people's dialogue boxes and their regular character art talking to each other. And they don't do what this is doing right here. So like in Caligula cutscenes, the camera will go everywhere. So let's see if it happens in this scene. Or maybe the next one. ねえ、君。隣の秘密のクラブなんて謎めいててかっこいい頃かななんかみんなの注目の的だしもしかして先輩情報持ってますえ私は何も知らないわよ。Like look at this. Look at this camera angle that we just switched to over the shoulder. And now this is a little more than a medium, a medium shot. It's a little wider than that. Like you can see down to uh, Kotano's knees. But this is what I'm talking about. そんなことより噂話が好きなんだったらカギピーって人のこと知らない。カギピー最近人気のドールピーの動画サイトなんかでもすごい再生数稼いでますよね。私も生主やってるけどあそこまではなかなかいいな。same。ビッグムード。と、話がずれちゃった。カギピーですよね。もう噂を知らないこともないですけど。本当教えてくれないカギピーのこと。私たちこの曲聞いてファンになっちゃって。代わりに帰宅部のことを教えてくれたらいい
この森田マルコさんが案内しちゃうよさあ行こう行こう目的地は3年4組だよそれじゃあ出発3年4組って言ったら3階の西にある教室だったな小太郎のグループはカギピーが見つからなかった時のために他の場所を調べておいてくれ Oh, that was weird. All right, now we gotta let this stupid, annoying Naruto follow us. Whatever. So, this is where we're gonna stop for now. I guess I wanna throw in there that I hope you saw what I mean. That one of this game's problems is it just stop it with the camera angle. Stop it. Just let the character portraits tell the story. Because the character designs of this game were actually fine. I liked them a lot. I like the overall like, aesthetic they tried to go for in terms of like concept art. The game, in game, Like visuals don't do it too much justice, but like the, the designs are actually pretty cool. I really like the idea of like keeping things really like、uh, muted and boring in terms of the uniforms, but then like everyone will have the flower designs. Like the EMC has his little bolo thing that he wears, and I don't even know what to call Shogo's thing, like the ascot. And you have like the flower designs that are on Kotono's collar, and everyone has that, the catharsis flowers. I just like, I like this game's character designs. I think they do look cool. There is something visually appealing about it, even if the game graphics look ugly. So, it, this game's like presentation would have been so much better if they just let the character portraits carry the story. Imagine if you were playing Persona 3 or Persona 4, because obviously those are the older games on PS2, etc. Vita. But、uh, imagine if the camera was like flying around and getting, getting in people's faces in those games. Think about how often you really stopped and looked at the character models in P3 or P4. Not that often. Because usually the camera was set up like way above the scene of the room, and you were kind of walking around almost isometrically. And then anytime people talked or had cutscenes, you were never looking at the character models. You were almost always looking at the portraits and people's expressions and reading what they're saying. And that's where the story should be told if your JRPG isn't like. Super highly detailed. If you're not like Final Fantasy 15, you should focus on something more simple. Try to make your JRPG look more like a playable visual novel if you're not going to be super great graphically. At least that's my opinion. Again, I'm not a designer. It's just I've, I've played a lot of games in this genre, and I think that、uh, for games that are more limited like this, that's your best option. Also, I'll throw in that.、Uh, Just in case, just so there's no confusion about it, because obviously I'm doing a lot of comparing and contrasting with Persona and P5. Remember, this game gets away with it a bit because it has Tadashi. He is the scenario and character writer, and the guy in. Well, I don't want to say that he completely invented the style, because obviously before P1 there is Shimigami Tensei If, but he really got it down, especially with P2. So any similarities to like older Persona, it's. It's totally excused because what can you say? Like, you can't complain that his work is re reminiscent of his work. It is what it is. And I'll also say that any, like, theming aspect of this game that are similar to P5, I want to point out that Caligula came out first. It did. Some people don't know that or they just forget. Caligula Vita, the original game, which is, like, almost identical to this one in terms of script, came out, like, three months before Persona 5. So, any. Any comparisons in terms of like terms like the metaverse and psychology and whatnot? This game came out first, so don't call it a ripoff. This thing has a lot of faults, but that's not one of them. Anyway, when we pick up next time, we got more of this game. We'll keep playing. We'll, we gotta explore the school some more. It's gonna take us a while until we find Kagi P and actually get to our first boss fight. So hopefully, in the future, we can try to condense down these dungeon sections a little bit. In the later dungeons, I'll come in a little over leveled. So, I won't have to spend as much time exploring and fighting enemies. But for this one, this first dungeon, it's a bit of a slog. We still got a ways to go. See you guys in the next one.